Hello, I'm Perrin Hello, Beatty, I'm... President and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and welcome to the Business of Business. Throughout the pandemic, I'll be having a series of conversations with government officials, with business leaders, and with other experts on the impacts of COVID-19 and where Canada's businesses go from here. Now, I'm delighted to be joined today by Suncor President and CEO Mark Little. Mark has been with Suncor since 2008 and has over 34 years of international energy industry experience. He last joined us in December to discuss Suncor's response to COVID-19 and the challenges that we faced navigating the pandemic. Mark, welcome back to the Business of Business. Yeah, thanks, Perrin, for having me. Well, now, the last time that we talked, you reflected on what a challenging year it had been for the industry and for the country. We're still in the tunnel, but with rising vaccination rates and with dramatic decrease in infections, at least the exit is starting to be in sight. Can you update us on where Suncor and the energy sector are now? Yeah, it's it's been an amazing ride. Um, and fortunately for us, the the industry has turned a lot. I mean, we're seeing $70 crude. <laughs> In the depths of COVID-19, we hit minus $40 for crude. Uh, and so it's been a it's been a really crazy time through that whole thing. And and in the depths of of the despair, I guess, associated with COVID-19 last spring, we actually saw demand dip down to about 80 million barrels. So 20% of all of the demand just literally disappeared kind of overnight. Um, but in the end, we probably lost somewhere in the six to 8% on the year. So we ended up with about you know, somewhere between uh, 92 and 94 thousand or million barrels a day on average through last year. So we, so it really was actually not a massive change in the total demand. It was just at certain times, it was very, very dramatic associated with it. So it's amazing how it's changed. And so much oil was shut in and so much money was taken out that now we're sitting here at uh, what we would view as disproportionately high prices relative to what we would consider a a stable long-term market, a $70 WTI associated with it. And, and uh, now demand isn't fully back. We still expect that we'll get back to full demand probably by the end of 2022. Um, and so we'll see, but, but there's so much money uh, that's taken out is that there's still uh, a bunch of oil offline and prices are very strong. And so I'll tell you one thing is, you know, this was very hard on the oil industry. There's no question about it and companies like Suncor, but boy, I just think about the airlines and tourism and some of the retail business restaurants that are just getting hammered through this. And they are, they're in a very different situation than we're in where right now we're generating a lot of cash. It's, when we spoke before, um, the industry was suffering from an, a, essentially a trifecta of misery where there'd been long-term low energy prices where uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia and others were, were driving prices down and then COVID with demand falling dramatically. Did you anticipate that we would see a turnaround this rapidly? Well, we certainly didn't. And, and we positioned the company to be very conservative through all of this period of time. Because as you know, Baron, it's kind of like, well, if you're not playing conservative and you get caught, uh, often there's no return from it. So, so as a company, and, and quite frankly, I think a lot of people, even that applauded some of the moves we made, like cutting our dividend, uh, early last year, now view we played too conservatively, and it's kind of like okay, at seventy dollar crude, I get, I get it. We can take the criticism associated with it. Our, you know, our our view was is hey, you're literally in a global pandemic like nothing we've seen in a very long period of time, and and you're having uh, parts of the industry fighting it out for market share and driving down the price, and and so you know, yeah, okay, maybe that's a that's a fair piece associated with it, but. Thankfully, we worked hard to keep the company strong, and we are strong and getting stronger literally by the day. That's one of the extraordinary elements that, that under all of this pressure that Suncor has managed to be so strong. And in addition to that, you've been making a number of announcements of measures that you're going to be taking, which are going to require major capital investments, which will set important uh, ESG goals for, for Suncor, uh, even while we're still in the midst of the pandemic. Can you tell us about that? Well, ours is a long-term play, right? <laughs> so when we think about how we move forward in this, 
uh, we always have to be thinking about where we're going for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And yes, there's times where we'll adjust the pace of various investments and actions or, or defer various pieces of the work, but it really doesn't change our strategy. I think, as you know, we stepped back and, and I think I talked about this last time we were together and redid our purpose of the company, you know, to provide trusted energy that enhances people's lives while caring for each other and the earth. And, and so this was a really profound <laughs> that we ended up doing that just before we went into COVID because caring for each other has taken on a whole new meaning in the last year, 18 months as we've as we've gone through this whole journey, both with COVID and and kind of the health aspects of it. Mental health is obviously a key focus area. And then the whole topic of racism that's emerged through this. But uh, and and then we had a number of investments that are around adding to different energy and expanding our energy offerings to our customer base, uh, like our big cogen up north, and which is driving down greenhouse gas emissions and also <laughs> increasing power uh, uh, that we can sell into the marketplace, 800 megawatt cogen associated with it. So we did defer it, but we kept that going. And, uh, and now we have, uh, in the last six months, we've made a number of more significant announcements around the strategy of the company, capital allocations, investments like the blue hydrogen project that we uh, talked about in Edmonton and such. So there's a, there's a lot going on there. Can we perhaps drill down a bit on on, on that topic? Um, when we met last time, you were talking about being purpose driven and what that purpose would be. There, there's a natural skepticism that Canadians have when they hear corporate leaders talking about about high principles driving the the company. But you've delivered in a number of areas since we last spoke in terms of the announcements that that, that you've made. Maybe we can take a look at some of those. Uh, for example, commitment in terms of net zero. Right. Yeah, that's not a trivial commitment. There's no question about it. it it's part of it, um, Perrin. It's interesting. It's almost like it, it could be a bumper sticker, right? Like it's it's kind of like it's easy. It's easy to say, oh yeah, okay, sure, sign up for net zero. But the issue with it is, is okay. Do we understand our business? Do we know where the emissions are coming from? Do we know how to apply technologies associated with it? So we did go through and make the commitment to be a net zero company by 2050. We went and looked at it and saw kind of five or six different ways we use energy that make up 98% of all the emissions in the company. More than 50% of our emissions come from steam and heat. And so it's kind of like, okay, we, we burn natural gas to generate steam associated with it. We know there's other ways we can do it. We can burn hydrogen and we, we are the, largest producer of hydrogen i think in the entire country we consume about 15 percent of all of canada's hydrogen people don't know that we do that no. because it always ends up in our products like jet fuel and gasoline and distillate and such but we are so we we know how to do that or we can take carbon sequestration and put these technologies onto our existing facilities and then sequester the carbon or we could switch to something like small modular nuclear so it's not that there aren't some options some of those are we could definitely do and we could do them you know if the technology is readily available it's just very costly so now we're trying to figure out okay well we know how to get to net zero um now the question is okay what well how do we do that and stay competitive as a company as an industry when you think about this in the context of the globe when most of the oil industry globally is not actually on the journey to net zero and and that's where we think that the solution and partnership between ourselves and the provincial government and the federal government that all benefit from the value of the oil resource uh, if we do that cooperatively and we work that together we can make progress and we can achieve this while maintaining the strength of the industry for the canadian economy i want to pursue this question of competitiveness so you don't control your prices you're very much subject to what takes place in international markets um, and yet you have taken on responsibilities that are going to drive up costs for you, at least in the in the short term. What does this mean for your competitiveness? Well, it's, it's interesting that uh, the way I tend to think about it, Farron, is when you look at the journey forward, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because in some ways, climate, I think, is bringing a gift to us. Now, it, which seems kind of odd when you're an oil sands producer and everybody kind of thinks, okay, but your carbon footprint is higher than others. 
but but in some ways it's the world's kind of saying look we've treated this as a commodity and we really didn't care anything about it other than we can get the commodity but now people are saying wait a minute now i actually want to put other layers on that i actually want to understand what impact that has on the environment and and i would add to that in the whole concept of esg right environment social and governance it's kind of like wait a minute what does it mean for the environment what does it mean socially what does it mean in a governance sense when you go and stack up Canada and Canada's oil sands globally against the other major producers globally associated with this, you'll find out like Canada, that is actually where Canada shines. We are massive engagers with the indigenous people of this country. We have human rights in the country. We we're, we're global champions of inclusion and diversity. We have proper governance. We have transparency, the rule of law that this is actually where we can really shine. So the one issue that we need to address, which quite frankly, everybody's really focused on today is climate. And so it's kind of like, fine, we need to go and deal with climate and we need to achieve it because we cannot continue to have an impact on the environment. But once that's done, I think Canada then becomes a shining example of the, the global kind of champion of ESG oil to the globe. And, and think about who we're competing against. In the top 10 countries with oil resource globally, there's only two that are democratic nations, ourselves and the United States. And, and then you think, okay, well, who else is in there? It's Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Russia, Venezuela, right? Like th that's who we're competing against. And so, we're really excited about the journey because we think that this will position Canada to be a long-term provider of and champion of ESG responsible oil to the world, uh, fully consistent with what the government said in the Industry Strategy Council report. So, so I, th I think this will actually ultimately long-term be a real blessing to Canada that we're in the situation we're in. So your message is not that Canada should be engaged in a, in a race to the bottom but that where we can win is if we're engaged in a race to the top by having yeah, that, higher standards in other countries. That's exactly it. And, and, and the push for climate is really starting to push this out of the commodity business into these broader attributes, which I think is where Canada really shines. And so I, you know, I think a lot of people have counted Canada out of this and, I, <laughs> and we, we certainly plan on winning this race. Now, you were mentioning uh, social goals, including engagement with Indigenous communities. I think most Canadians still aren't aware of the extent of procurement that, that Suncor does uh, with Indigenous businesses that far outstrips that done by the Government of Canada. Yeah, it's like, like last year we spent $911 million with Indigenous businesses, which is huge. Um, and, and as I think we talked before, we did this East Tank Farm deal where we entered into a joint venture with two First Nations so that even through the crisis of COVID and the entire industry going into uh, very difficult times, they were able to get their payments around uh, their investment in the joint venture, um, which is a tank farm that blends and ships product and all those sorts of things associated with it. And they're taking that money uh, and it's not just a business venture for them, it goes into infrastructure and elder care and education and all of the things that often we take for granted in so many of the communities across the country. So, so it's, it's really exciting to see and we, we think this has been a fantastic tool to take out some of the commodity risk that gets built in for their services and such. So, no, and, and this is one of many different joint ventures we have. We also are building, uh, there's been a number of Petro-Canada stations that have been built on First Nations. And so we've worked with them. And again, they can generate revenue. And, and we've, it's, we've just seen a massive increase in that. Um, I think we have about 40 stations now that we've built and, and literally a few years ago it was something like 15 stations that we had so that's that's been increasing dramatically. We have a joint venture with a First Nation in Ontario with a wind farm, one of our wind farm projects, or we have another joint venture where we are the minority partner. It's actually operated by the First Nation business entity. 
and uh, in Quebec. And so there's some really exciting interactions that we've had, but no, it's, it's very significant. And we've been moving away from thinking about it as a social goal and through working with First Nations and, and uh, Métis and, and uh, various Indigenous groups across the country, we've kind of morphed this into what we call a journey of reconciliation. Uh, and, and that's how they tend to think about it uh, in the Indigenous community, and, and that's how we're thinking about it. So, you know, we're, we're still learning and growing, and, but it's been exciting, and, and I'll tell you, to see the fundamental changes happening within the communities because of our partnership has been fantastic. There, there, there are lessons here, obviously, for other Canadian businesses. So, um, our viewers could be forgiven if, if in reading the newspapers or in watching television, they, they, they bought into a caricature of Indigenous peoples as being opposed to any sort of development, and particularly to being opposed to resource development, and particularly being uh, opposed to resource development in the energy sector. That's not been your experience, though. Um, tell us about, yeah. you, you evidently see the relationship not as an obstacle, but as an advantage. Tell us about the mindset behind that and, and what lessons there are here for other businesses. Yeah, do you know it's interesting, Perrin, that um, just in my own personal journey, like I, you know, I grew up born and raised in Calgary, grew, so grew up in Western Canada. There's a whole bunch of First Nations, including Sutina First Nation. And I grew up just north of that community. And, and like literally in my entire existence for the longest time, I, I knew nothing about the Sutina Nation and such. And, uh, and really I started in the oil industry, engaging with communities, uh, particularly when I was in Cold Lake. Um, working there with Cold Lake First Nations and all of the, I, I think there's seven lake, you know, um, communities that are there and, and we were working with the communities and, and you just see like there's such a great opportunity for engagement. And so for myself, there's been this massive personal journey of learning and growing and uh, I, I'm just so thankful to so many of the chiefs and community members and stuff that have had the time to help me uh, learn and to communicate their stories and to understand them. And so I've learned so much through that journey. I, I did go to the um, reconciliation session and, and saw the National Chief Sean Atlio um, talk at the uh, at National Reconciliation and, uh, and get a chance to talk to, in some cases, people that I knew <laughs> for a very long period of time, but I had never really heard their deep story about, you know, their journey through um, the whole residential schools and the implications on them and their families and, and people that they knew and such. And so now as, as I build, continue to build relationships, I, I have heard these deep, deep personal stories from a number of people I know. And it's kind of like, it's, it's crazy to think that in our country, in Canada, that we have a whole segment of the population where their life expectancy is something like 10 years less than anyone else in the country. And, and you just think this is crazy and they don't have proper drinking water. And, and, and honestly, I tell people like, if we took this out of the Canadian context and you know, played it at 1 a.m. on a Friday night, it, and it would sound like this was a third world nation in uh, in one of the challenged parts of the world and and to me it's like as a canadian it's shameful that we're in that situation and i think as part of our journey yes we have to be continue to generate returns for our shareholders and such but but to be able to pull alongside and actually help them uh, achieve a journey of reconciliation economically and then to start to get the services so that they can deal with some of these issues I, I mean, for me, it's a it's very personal, um, and and it is for many of the people in our organization. We we have taken a number of our people, most of our people, and actually given them a whole education about the journey and and the implications and all of the history of the indigenous people. It's not something that I uh, learned when I was in school, but uh, it's it's changed us, and and we are proud partners. <laughs> and community members and neighbors with many of the indigenous communities and, and we love it. 
and and I would say the relationship has changed us. Can we come back to the product of, of Suncor? Um, it's significant that you are Suncor Energy and not Suncor Oil. Um, it's a point that's often missed by people. You are one of the largest investors in renewables in Canada. How do you see the future for the company? What, what will happen in terms of the product mix and what sort of speed will this take place at? Yeah, it's interesting, Perrin. We just did a bunch of work on this to actually try and articulate it. And, uh, and, uh, and so we, we just went and restated our strategy to be, to be Canada's leading energy company by growing businesses in low GHG fuels, electricity, and hydrogen, uh, while sustaining and optimizing our existing hydrocarbon business and transforming our GHG footprint. And, and one of the reasons that we said that is, you know, part of the issue, it's, it's so easy to kind of like, okay, great, we're going to go do this. But one of the things we've been trying to figure out is what do we bring to the table that, and, and what skills do we have? And why would anybody want us to be involved? And, and can we add value or are we more focused on our survival than driving real shareholder return because we have the skills and capabilities to do this? So every single one of those, whether it's power or whether it's biofuels, um, or whether it's in the hydrogen space. The reason we pick those three is, one, we think that they're a big part of the future. Everybody thinks electricity is a big part of the future. Um, but the other thing is, is in every single case, we've been in the wind business for over two decades. We've, we've been making hydrogen for five decades and, and we're the largest player. We think we're the largest player in the entire country on making and, and consuming hydrogen. And biofuels, we've been in for over two decades. We changed our, our name to Suncor Energy in 1997 to reflect the realities of this. Today, you're seeing companies actually make these changes and change their names, but we just view this as a continuation of our journey. And by us now articulating these three groups, um, our view is, is kind of like, okay, we need to like we need to push forward and think about this more in the context of this being a business for the company than it being an asset or a project within the company. And uh, and so like power is an example. We send something like uh, four to five hundred megawatts of power to the grid every day. Uh, we're building an eight hundred megawatt project and a two hundred megawatt wind farm. So we're we are, I think right now, the fifth largest power producer in the province of Alberta. Uh, we'll be number two or number three in the province. And, and people don't think of Suncor uh, as that company, but we are that company and, and we're excited about it. And now we've started through Canada's electric highway for the first time in all three of these areas. It's the first time that we're actually starting to sell one of these three, whether it's biofuels, electricity and such right to the end consumer. And so, so we're, this is an exciting change for us and uh, it's a big journey, but we're starting to think about this as a business and then how do we maximize the value and what's our value proposition? How do we interface with the customers? So when you're talking about things like biofuels and hydrogen and such, a lot of this is targeted at the big wholesale um, and industrial customers and such. But, you know, on the electric highway, we're selling to our retail customers. Your starting point is that, that we're going to need all of the affordable energy of whatever sort we can get our hands on, but it has to be produced in a way that is responsible. So it's not a matter of abandoning uh, oil and, and gas, but ensuring that, that it's produced to the highest possible environmental and social standards. That, that that's exactly right is and and what we're seeing is that the energy that people are consuming it will morph and change over a period of time but uh, you know we're very proud of the work we do in the oil industry we have a fantastic customer base associated with it and and we continue to work to make it better and stronger and reduce the environmental effects every single day this has been an issue which has become intensely politicized in canada as, as it has in other parts of the world um, are you satisfied that the Canadian business leaders recognize the opportunities that there that are out there in terms of uh, renewables and in terms of of environmentally friendly technologies? Is Canada competitive? Are we investing enough in that area? And are our business leaders leading sufficiently? 
Yeah, there's there's lots of attributes to that question that you just asked. It's, it's interesting that uh, we view this, we're a fully integrated player. By what we mean by that is right from pulling the oil out of the ground right through to the end consumer at our Petro Canada uh, network across the country. And, and so we're playing in, in that entire value chain. So one of the things we find is that, oh, when hydrogen comes up, we see that both in our upgrading business as well as our refining business. But if you're a pure upstream producer, it's kind of like, okay, this is, you're not involved unless maybe you're selling conventional natural gas to somebody that makes hydrogen. So I, th I think one of the joys of our business model is the fact that we actually do this every day. And so these opportunities that are coming up, and I, I kind of have described it from the from the tank at the upstream through to the consumer, this is where the transformation or a lot of these energy changes are, are starting to occur. So I think as a company, we see ourselves as playing a quite a unique role in there because most of the industry are upstream oriented associated with it. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of opportunities that people don't necessarily see because where they fit in the value chain associated with it. And then often, the companies that see it in the clean tech side often don't have the the uh, project organizations or the balance sheet or the cash flow to be able to invest in it. So it's one of the uniquenesses that uh, that we see ourselves bring into the table. If but if you look at like as an example, if you look to the United States, uh, there's there's some legislation like 45Q in the U.S. Their tax system is very different. Um, but but it actually incents a lot of things like carbon sequestration and those sorts of things to happen through what I would consider, I would almost describe as a generic policy. Anybody can do a project and actually qualify. Here we tend to, you know, and thankfully, and, I, and I'm really thankful that the federal government has put forward uh, opportunities in the budget for investment tax credits associated with carbon sequestration because we're literally viewed as one of the best jurisdictions on the surface of the earth for carbon sequestration, particularly in Alberta. So, so I think this could be a real big part of helping Canada achieve its carbon goals. Um, so they've put a tax incentive. So we've started now to put some of the framework in place, but you know, this needs cooperation by the Alberta government that, that uh, owns all of the poor space in the province and, and they, you know, license that out or, or provide that to uh, various producers and, and projects and such, right through to the federal government about, okay, well, all this money that's being generated from the industry, how can some of it come back to invest in these projects to help us decarbonize and stay competitive so that we have a long-term economy for Canada? So I, I think I would have said we can do more, and, and we've, but I do see that both uh, provincially and federally, and whether that's in, you know, in the East Coast or whether it's in Alberta or wherever else, there, there's a lot of stuff starting to happen in Canada. So I think we'll, we'll start accelerating our journey here in the coming years. Final topic I want to touch on. Uh, as a senior business leader, you're called upon by governments at the federal and provincial level to provide advice on, on public policy and where we should be going uh, with the Canadian economy. We are now approaching the mouth of the tunnel where, where recovery is on the other side. What advice are you giving to governments in terms of what they should be doing to speed up uh, the recovery and to ensure that it's something that's sustainable? Yeah, Perrin, there, I, I would say there's a few ways, like over the last year, and I guess it was about last summer that uh, I was asked to actually participate on the Industry Strategy Council that was led by Monique LaRue and, and lots of other colleagues in all the various, representing all the different, uh, or a number of key industries in Canada. Often they were industries that were getting hit really hard, like tourism and airlines, transportation, those sorts of things, manufacturing. Um, so, so I, I participated in that and we wrote a report and provided that to the government. And, and you know, I, I still think there's a lot of really good advice in there and, and they've acted on some of those pieces associated with it. I think the big thing, and as you point out, is kind of like, okay, wait a minute, 
we're, we're now starting to lead on single dose vaccinations. Uh, yes, we have a lot of work to do to get it fully vaccinated. I was just fully vaccinated the other day, so this is fantastic. I'm excited about it. But I think we're going to see second doses really taking off. And, and so the, the issue with it is for us to get the economy going, because we all know that the Canadian government just can't continue to fund a whole massive part of the economy. It's kind of like, well, if we believe the science and vaccines work, then let's get on with it and, and let's get the economy going and getting people back. I think it's important both for the economy and for the mental health of people across the country. Uh, obviously, whether it's whether we're talking about climate or whether we're talking about vaccines, we're big believers in science. And, and so we need to go on this journey. And I, and I think it's super important that we follow the science. And, and if we have those safeguards in place that we work to actively and aggressively open up the economy, uh, looking at whether it's opening the border or if you're, if you're distinguishing between people that have vaccines and ones that don't, if there's certain activities, it's kind of like, okay, everybody has the option to get vaccinated if they wish but uh, we just can't keep people locked down and, and funded by the government. Uh, otherwise, we're never gonna get out of this. So we're, we're excited and, and we continue to take the position that we should get the economy started. We should believe the science and as the protections come in, which they are, that we need to, uh, we need to stop these lockdowns and, and get things going. And so, and, and in a perfect world, we would like to see the provincial economies and the federal government all coordinate these programs because then people can freely move around the country and we can and we can work to really help get the country restarted and the economy restarted so and it's exciting i think this should be happening like now as we start to see it uh, this has been a tough time and the third wave i think was particularly tough in canada that we didn't see in other countries because we were slow to get started on vaccines but that's changed and it's kind of like, OK, perfect. Then let's go and uh, start moving forward. So that's where we're at. Mark, sadly, we're out of time. This is a conversation that it could have continued for a lengthy period. And it's a conversation that will be resuming in different ways over the you know, over coming months. The issues that you've set out are, are critical ones for Canada and both Suncor and you personally are providing important leadership for Canadian business and for the Canadian economy. Thank you so much for being with us today and thank you for the leadership that you're providing for Canadians. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me, Perrin. It's always a pleasure.